so today, uh, as has been announced, we are establishing uh, two new elders, Brother Doug and Brother Stan, um, to the eldership. And so uh, we're very excited about that. And I talked a lot about the responsibility of elders, the responsibility of deacons, and flock. Today it's our turn. <laughs> it's our turn today. We're going to look at the duty of the flock. Oh, man, I had such a pretty font on there, but I guess it didn't. It wasn't compatible with this Windows, but forgive me for that. So, uh, so after studying about the responsibilities of the shepherds to the flock, it would be beneficial for us as the flock to understand where our duties lie as members of the body of Christ. And I'd like to just point back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, when we started this series, when Paul writes, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And so he's recognizing that we all make up the body of Christ. Is Doug and Stan members of the body of Christ? Yes. Are you and I any less members of the body of Christ? Absolutely not. We're all one in Christ. But there is distinctions. We do have difference. We do different things. We have different gifts. Verse 15 says, If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. So we have to understand that though there are different functions, that doesn't mean it's more important or less important than another member. Because it's, after all, it's the unification of all these different parts of the body gathered together, working together with one another, that fulfills and creates the body of Christ. Verse 18, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. And so there's something divine about the structure of the church. There's something that God wills for the church, and he re has revealed his will for there to be shepherds that we appoint. But also there's this clue throughout Scripture in this statement that God also appoints the eldership. So we need to recognize that, but that's for a little later. So the church is not the shepherds. The church is not the preacher. The church is all of us working in fellowship with one another. That's what makes up the church. It's easy to mistake the church for its leadership, right? That's not the case. It's the whole collective that makes up the church. And what happens when we have that view is it ends up that we assign all the problems of the church, we put it all at the feet of the elders, and all the successes of the church. Maybe we tend to put it all at the feet of the elders. Now, you know, there is some credit and honor that is worthy of an elder um, who works in these things. But however, the truth is we are all responsible for taking an active role in the local body of Christ. Just because we're appointing more elders, that doesn't mean, oh boy, I get to sit back and do less. <laughs> right? that's, not, that's not what's going on here. It's crucial that we all take active roles in the body of Christ. We all have a purpose. We all have a function. It's not like the only function is elder, deacon, preacher. There are many different functions. Revelation 3.1, I just want to point this out. And throughout all these letters, you notice that there's, this con uh, there's either this commending and, or this challenge or this judgment against these different churches. Remember the seven letters to the churches? And notice that not one of those letters does he say to the elders of the church in Thyatira or to the shepherds uh, in Sardis, right? Who's it addressed to? The church. The church as a whole. He doesn't make distinguishing by different roles. It's you all. <laughs> you all are a collective. You are all together in this. You all are the church. So it's not the elders or the deacons or the preachers and teachers that are accused or commended. It's the church as a whole. We are not off the hook concerning responsibilities simply because we're not elders and deacons. We are collectively responsible for the church's worship and its culture. And it talks about this, the angel or the spirit of this church. We all contribute collectively to the spirit of our church and so we need to remember that right that we have to take responsibility and part in that work so the question that i hope to look at this morning is what are our duties as the flock so first one know the shepherds <laughs> first duty of a flock of a sheep at a local body of christ is to know the shepherds this comes from first thessalonians 5 and verse 12 when paul is writing to the thessalonians he says we ask you brothers to respect, and that's edu, which means to see with the eyes. <laughs> that's what it literally means, to see with the eyes, to see, to know those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. It's our duty to know the shepherds. Again, I want to repeat that because I think this is backwards. Some people visit churches or become part of the church and they're just of a local body and they're just like, well, the elders never talk to me and I just agree with what they do and they've never, you know done anything for me it's like 
have you introduced yourself to them? <laughs> have you talked to them? <laughs> have you asked them questions? Have you invited them into your home? Have you gone out and gone golfing or something? That's, that's your responsibility as the sheep to know your shepherd. And that has to be the case because we looked out among ourselves at Main Street and we put forward men to serve as elders. So that implies you have to know them, right? You need to know these men. James 5.14, why is it important? Why is it important to know our shepherds? Notice this, what James write. it writes. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, he writes in verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Notice he's equating the spiritual sickness to the physical sickness he just talked about, that there's healing, both spiritually and physically. The, power, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And that is true, yes, I mean, any righteous person. But you know, typically, by the nature of the qualification of an elder, they are righteous men, right? So that's why you guarantee, you know, you go to the elders when you have these things. But who's responsible? Who, whose responsibility is it to ask for the elders' assistance? Notice what he said. If anyone is sick, let him. <laughs> let him call the elders, right? That is your response. You, at the end of the day, right, like you can't my wife can't make me go to the doctor, right? Now, she can tell me, hey, you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the doctor, but it doesn't happen until I actually call the doctor and make an appointment, right? The responsibility is upon me for my spiritual and physical well-being. And who do we go to? Our elders. That's a scriptural pattern we have. Go to the elders, the one who is struggling. That's our responsibility. And this may shock you. I could be wrong. Gis, Dutch, correct me if I'm wrong. As of yet, elders do not have mind-reading capabilities. Am I wrong? Oh, I don't know about that one. Uh, all right, well, I'm getting very cryptic answers, so I'm going to stick with what I know. No, <laughs> elders do not have mind-reading capabilities. And it's amazed me, and I've seen this firsthand, you know, folks will complain about, like, a call that the eldership has made, and they'll be talking to their friends or something, be like, I can't believe they did that, blah, 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 or I disagree with that. And then I just wonder, and then I ask them, you know, well, have you talked to them? Oh, no. That's the point. <laughs> That's the point of having shepherds is you know them. You can feel comfortable to come to them, to talk to them. And then the, the amazing thing is when we struggle, like if we're trapped in, in a sin or like habitual sin, or maybe we're going through chronic health issues, the shepherds are there for those things. And I know a lot of de denominations have this role of like spiritual uh, like spiritual counselor that people go to for like spiritual help and so forth. Well, I got news. That's that's what a shepherd is. <laughs> that's the purpose of the shepherd. Is they're your spiritual counselors. They're your spiritual confidants. They are the people out of anyone that you can be vulnerable and ask for help from. And I think some people think they have to act like perfect in front of the eldership, but it's like, no, they're there for when you struggle. Like, that's the point of a shepherd is to keep you safe, to feed you, to make sure you're taken care of. So why is it important for the flock to personally know our elders for the exact situations that James describes? In, a t in our time of sickness, despair, spiritual struggle, or sin, we have an avenue for spiritual, spiritual guidance and for God's deliverance that is accessed through our local shepherds. And you will not feel comfortable with being vulnerable with someone at your low points in life if you haven't had a conversation with them. If you've never done any activity out of Sunday morning worship with them, you're not going to feel comfortable to express to them your struggles and your problems and get that help. So you're missing out if you don't know your shepherds. The elders don't know what our problems are if we never communicate them. And I promise you guys, I've done it before. Believe it or not, I have actually, you know, needed help with something or had a concern. And you know what I did? I asked Gist and Dutch to talk to me. And you know what they did? They said, no, we're never talking to you. And no, of course not. They sat down, they listened. They listened to me and they helped me. And I promise you, they're going to do that for you too. And I can promise you that Doug and Stan are going to do the same thing that Gist and Dutch have done. Don't be intimidated. They're there to lend an ear, to lend advice, to lend a verse, to pray, to guide you, to give you good, sound advice. 
when we think of the work of the shepherd, when we have the mindset of the work of the shepherd is uh, printing off balance sheets and you know, making sure the budget's in line, then uh, it's, you're going to miss out on all of this. Then we're totally stripping away the whole point of what shepherds are. So the question is, have you ever been in a spiritual rut? Who do you call? <laughs> Go, Spice. No. You call the elders. When you're having marriage problems and you need help, who do you talk to? You talk to your shepherd. Now, some people think you call the preacher. No, I, I'm 25. Like, I'm a 20. Don't. Don't ask me for marriage advice, right? I'm figuring it out. If you want to know about teachings, like, if you want to know, like, the Hebrew and Greek words about marriage and, like, Jewish marriage festivals and that kind of thing, yeah, ask me. I'm your guy. I'll nerd out with you all day. If you want practical advice for your day-to-day life in areas you're struggling in, you go to the shepherds. Not the 24-year-old, 25-year-old almost. Almost 25. Maybe that counts for something. Yeah. That's what they're there for. It's what the shepherds are there for. When you disagree with the direction the church is going in, you know what you don't do? Go and round up every member that agrees with you and then stir up this whole gossiping circle. You know what you do? You talk to your shepherds. Talk to them, all right? Please understand this is your job. This is what God is telling us. Flock, me, you all, this is our job. It's our duty. Just like they have duties, they have responsibilities, we're not off the hook. This is something we are commanded to do. And why? Is it just out of this tyranny? It's a, no, it's for you. <laughs> it's for me. It's for our benefit. We're the ones who benefit from this. When we, you have good shepherds, we win. <laughs> like, that's what we need to be striving for. Why else is it important for us to know our shepherds? Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Now, this isn't specifically about elders, but I think it's certainly applicable. Uh, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Watch how they conduct themselves, right? Because that's the whole point of an elder is he's been proven. He has established results. So you look at those results and you say, I want those results for me and my family as well. So I look at what decisions they made. You see, that's there for imitation. And you don't know what decisions they made or what they've gone through in their life if you only say hi on Sunday mornings. And that's the extent of your relationship. You don't know those things. You have no standard or goal to imitate if you don't know your eldership. You can't see, uh, I already said that. So, duties of the flock. Know the shepherds. <laughs> know your shepherds. Why? Spiritual assistance for whatever it may be, or physical health, and also to have a spiritual like barometer, a spiritual goal. Like, I want my life to look like that when I'm their age. When I'm their age. First, <laughs> first, <laughs> second point. Duties of the flock. Esteem the shepherds. After I just made a joke about age. Maybe I have to <laughs> put my foot in the mouth on that one. Uh, esteem the shepherds. So 1 Thessalonians 5.13, it says, And to esteem them very highly, the eldership, the shepherds, in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. So why should we have a high view of the elders? Because of all the work that they and their family spend and toil on for our benefit. And elders... Don't become elders for fun. <laughs> I, I hate to break it to you. Elders don't become elders just because it's just such a field of daisies and cotton candy and gumdrops. Because guess what? You know a funny thing about people? You'll never make everyone happy. <laughs> you know, and there's always going to be frustrations. And you know what they're called to do? In sacrificial love, always show patience and be the standard of what it's like to be Christ-like, even at people's worst. So you think about it, and all the responsibility they have for your and I's soul, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a picnic, right? So recognize that. They're not doing this for fun. They're not doing this for, like, authority or to be a tyrant. It's because they want to serve and love, because they want to spend their time, their mental energy, to make sure that our spiritual welfare is, is growing and that we are protected against Satan. So, you know, think about that for a second. So what does this high esteem look like practically? Well, I'd like to direct your attention to 1 Timothy 5.19. When Paul tells Timothy, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So what does this look like? It means we don't believe the first rumor or gossip we hear about an elder. We hear, did you see elder so-and-so did this? That shouldn't have any weight in our minds. No wait, that's just gossiping. <laughs> that's just divisive. That doesn't mean we should be naive, however. But there's no accusation should bear any way in our minds without good evidence from a multiplicity of witnesses. 
right? So we're not dumb, but we're also not ready to pounce at the first bad news or bad thing we hear about an elder. Though we should recognize, and this is important, elders are humans. And what's the problem with humans? <laughs> we mess up. So an eldership is not perfect. They're not perfection. And so we have to recognize that. But uh, again, this isn't used directly of elder, but you may know elder does imply age, that there is supposed to be an older age to them, um, which is nothing to be ashamed of. I think we need to change our culture on that. Like, be proud of your age. Like, gray hair is the glory <laughs> of a man. That's what Proverbs tells us. So 1 Timothy 5.1 says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers. So if you see an elder making a bad decision or sinning or doing something or saying something you shouldn't have done and you witness it, you know, first of all, you just recognize, hey, they're human. <laughs> they're human. And if it really bugs you, if it's really bad, you talk to them, but how do you talk to them? I can't believe that. You're an elder of the church. And you're actually like, what does he say? Dress him as a father. Address them as if your dad did something wrong that you feel like you need to talk to him about. You know, I would not step to my dad and be like, you're wrong. You know what? You're going to. Yeah, he, he could still whoop me. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But that's the kind of mentality and approach that we must have when we uh, discuss things with our elders. So when an elder makes a bad call, a bad action, we don't use it as an opportunity to dogpile on them, to berate them. We instead encourage them as we remember that we ourselves fall short every day. That's the point. That's the whole log in our own eye, speck in the others. Right? That's the perception. You know what the biggest sin is? The sin you should be most concerned about is yours. That's what Jesus tells us. The flock should not participate in gossip and divisive speech about our local shepherds. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles. Who's this directed to? The whole church. Guys, this is our responsibility. Watch out. Keep a keen eye because it happens. I've been at congregations where this has happened. So we all have to be wary. Keep your eyes out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. Anytime there's this divisive language or the separating or these camps forming in a church, that's not sound doctrine. That's not what sound doctrine produces. That's not Christ's gospel. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. You know, and I, I learned this a long time ago, and uh, an older preacher told, told me this. He said, you know, You'll get up there and you'll do a sermon, you young guys, and someone will walk up and just say, that is the best sermon I've ever heard. That was just so amazing. He's like, don't trust what people say. He's like, because watch, if you pay attention, someone will get up there and do an absolutely horrible lesson. It'll be like wrong, it'll be way too long, it'll be not well thought out, not well re represented. And then you'll see those same brothers and sisters walk up to that brother and go, that was the best sermon I've ever heard. He's like, you know, if someone's talking about constantly how great you are, be skeptical. <laughs> right? Be wary. Don't be judgmental, but realize, especially if that, ins that, that compliment and that good feeling is coming with the slandering and the tearing down of someone else. That's when we have to be careful. Keep a watch out for that. So many churches have split and damaged the spiritual lives of many Christians, and some have fallen away, often because the flock engages and tolerates people who create divisions between the flock and the shepherds. The shepherds don't shepherd for fun, and then if you, you know, people complain about the eldership and stuff, if that happens, my question is, do you want to do it? Are you qualified to do it? Because guess what? <laughs> you know, do it or be quiet, <laughs> right? You know, it makes changes, you do something about it, or just keep it to yourself. Uh, and finally, duties of the flock, submit to the shepherds. So know the shepherds, esteem the shepherds, and submit to the shepherds. And that comes from Hebrews 13, 17, again, leaders, which is uh, applicable to the eldership, obey your leaders and submit to them. I'm breaking off this verse. So the word submit there, I'm not going to say the Greek because it's weird. It's a weird pronunciation. I'm better at Hebrew than, than Greek. It says, uh, from, uh, to resist no longer, but to give way, yield properly of combatants. So notice the context in which this word is talking about submitting. Submitting means by its very nature that there's a disagreement. See, it's used of combatants, that you yield, that you kind of like tap out in a conflict. So to submit means that we yield to our will when it contradicts the will of our shepherds. So this is an action of both will and attitude. It's a, too hard, it's a hard thing, and it's an action thing. 
we can obey the eldership without submitting to the eldership. If we physically do the actions, but in our hearts we haven't yielded to what their desire is, as long as, again, as long as it's based in scripture and, and sound and not lording it over or extending beyond authority within their confines, but we've already talked about that. But these guys aren't going to be like making random mandates for us, all right? At least I'm aware of, no, all right. <laughs> okay. Their decisions are based for the edification of the saints, that they're taking care of our spiritual welfare. So what we have to realize, if they make a call that maybe I don't like, maybe it's not even sinful. Maybe it's about like when, what times we meet or how long uh, sections of, of, of worship are supposed to go. You know, anything like that. Then you feel like, I don't like that. Well, you have to understand, they're not making decisions based on the will of a handful of individuals. They're trying to make the collective best decision for as many people as they can, for as many of the sheep that they can. So I know we all have our individual preferences and likes and dislikes, but when an eldership makes a decision, sometimes it's not even, they don't even like the decision. Sometimes they don't even like what they're doing, but they sacrifice their will for the will of the good of the whole congregation. So keep that in mind. We'll not always agree with the decisions of the elders, um, but, so why should we listen to them then? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> if I disagree, why, why should I listen? It says, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So it is they who stand before God for their decisions, not us. <laughs> Realize that. They don't stand before us. They stand before God for their, uh, their decisions concerning their work. They are hyper aware of their responsibilities. You ask each one of these guys, they are, they are very aware of the gravity of the role that they're taking on. They understand that. So don't grieve them. <laughs> don't make their lives uh, miserable. Don't make it hard for them to do their job. But why else? He says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Why? For that would be of no advantage to you. By resisting and fighting against the eldership, you're not doing yourself any favors. You're shooting yourself in the foot because we're the body of Christ, right? We're all members. And so when you attack a member of the body, you're attacking Christ. You're attacking yourself. You're attacking your own welfare. Uh, but what if you feel very strongly about a certain decision by the elders that you disagree with? What should we do then? Well, I like the easy read version because guess what? It's kind of part of the qualifications of an elder. It says he must not drink too much and he must not be someone who likes to fight. He must be gentle and peaceful. Why do they need to be gentle and peaceful and not prone to arguing? Why? So that way you can have difficult conversations. So you can approach them so that you can speak to them even when you disagree. You bring it to them. Elders are supposed to be approachable and reasonable for a reason, so that you can work out your concerns with your shepherds, not against your shepherds. We're on the same team. We're on the same side. I know we all know this, all right? I know, like, I, I don't see this, you know, working here, but it's something that we have to look out for because it doesn't mean it will never happen. It doesn't mean that things won't take place. So Mark 3, 25, Jesus says, And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And Paul tells us that the church is the household of God. We are members of the household of God. A church is not in submission to the shepherds. A church not in submission to the shepherds is a house divided against itself. It won't stand. It's civil war. We're just going to collapse all of us. So when we are submitting and obeying qualified elders, we are obeying God. Acts 20, 28 it says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which, who? The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he had obtained with his own blood. So there's a divine ordainment by God through the eldership. So we recognize we're not just submitting to Stan. I'm not submitting to Dutch. I'm not submitting to Gist. I'm not submitting to Doug. I'm submitting to Christ because this is his plan. And these are those who have been appointed. So is it ever okay to disobey an eldership? Well, I use the Acts 4 principle. When their government, when their rulers tell them not to preach about Jesus anymore, and what do they say? If you think we should obey man rather than God, yeah, uh, we're going to keep doing this. So anytime, if they, the only time that it's okay to not submit, to not obey an eldership, is when it contradicts what God has revealed. And that's the only exception. Um, I already said that. Even then, there should be an opportunity for repentance, as we've already established. If they do do something wrong or make a bad call, even then, that's not like, okay, the disbanding, you shouldn't be an elder more. It's you acknowledge it. You address it. And First, first Timothy 5.19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Notice that there's a period for grace there. 
that you address them, and then you give them an opportunity to change. And then if they're unrepentant, just know I'm, I'm going with, the, with, with my opinion and we're adding this unscriptural thing, you know, then it's addressed. So there has to be room for grace. Um, the local body of Christ that meets here in Mount Sterling, we have looked out among ourselves and we have put forward both Stan and Doug to serve as shepherds. And so with this in mind, I'm going to ask Doug and Stan to come up here in order to publicly commend them to the church and uh, the church to them. And we will recognize that from this point on, Doug and Stan are taking the role of shepherds among us. So uh, we're, we're going to have them come up and we'll say a quick prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the spiritual family that you have created through the death of your son, through the resurrection and glorification of your son, that though we have no works to boast of or no lineage to be proud of, you have called us to be your children and members of your son's body. And Father, this morning we put forward Brother Stan and Brother Doug to serve as shepherds appointed by you at the local body here at Main Street. Father, we ask that you be with these men and their families, that you help them in this work, that you encourage them, that you give them wisdom and discernment to make good decisions, to be good shepherds. Help us as the congregation, as the flock, to be submitting to them, to yield our will to theirs, to love them and to esteem them and not work against them, but work all together in peace and unity for the glorification of your Son and for the furtherance of your kingdom in our community. Father, we ask that you bless us in this endeavor, that you help us grow, and that all that we do in word or deed is to the glorification of you. It's in your Son's name that we lift up these men. Amen. So this wasn't really much about conversion. <laughs> so, so that wasn't really the point of this lesson this morning. But if you're not a Christian, or maybe you're an apathetic Christian, that you've just been used to sitting in the pew, and you're fine there. And you want to stay there the rest of your life. You're comfortable where you are. You're comfortable not doing anything, not knowing the elders. You're more comfortable skating by. You're missing out on life. You're missing out on quality of life. Jesus came that his people might have life and have it more abundantly. And part of the way that he extends to us this life and these blessings is through humans that he has redeemed, that he has created new creatures out of to be image bearers for the Son. Just like Adam and Eve were image bearers for God in the garden, that's what we do in the church. We imitate Christ. We reflect Christ to one another. And if you're just standing by yourself, your light's very dim. Or more scarily, you're in darkness. So we know we must follow the chief shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 4, when he, after talking about the overseers, he says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. That life is extended us through the chief shepherd. As John tells us that he laid down his life for the sheep so that he can raise it up again, so that he will raise us up on the last day. And how we do that is we're born of water and spirit, that we believe that we eat the Son of Man. That we have faith in what Jesus did and what he accomplished. And that we have heard, and so we believe, and so we repent, and so we are washed of our sins and raised up a new creature. If you would like to participate in that journey, or if maybe you're an apathetic Christian, please consider these things. This is a command from God. This isn't a suggestion that you know your elders. This is for your benefit. That's how God wants to have an impact in your life. It's through humans. So we ask that if you have any need, if you want to become a Christian, come for it as we stand and sing.